uh, it's really just such a privilege to be um, back here with New Day this evening. Um, Angie and I have uh, been away for how long? Six or seven years? Seven years. We're in our seventh year of, uh, of leading um, Upper Room in, in Santon or Bryanston. We're on the border of Santon and Bryanston. Some people often ask us, where do we meet? And it's, and it's, it's on the border. Santon, Bryanston, it's like somewhere on the border, like no man's land. But uh, we've been away for seven years, and uh, I've known for quite some time that I'm going to be ministering here this evening, and I've been praying, and I've just been saying, Lord, what is it that you've got for New Day? 28 years of, of having their footprint here. I know it started um, with Greg and Hensia back in the day in their home, but uh, what have you got for New Day 28 years in? And uh, this afternoon, as I was just in my study, I felt the Lord just lay a couple of things on my heart, but uh, what I'm going to say now isn't just for, for New Day as a, as a body. I believe it's something for you as an individual. And when, G, when, uh, JD, when DJ prayed, I, he said something. He talked about footprints. And uh, I felt the Lord say to me this afternoon that spiritually, New Day has a far greater footprint than what you can see in the natural. A far greater footprint than what you can see in the natural. And I'm reminded of Psalm 16. It says, Surely we have a delightful inheritance. Our boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. And New Day, I want to say to you, your boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. And what you see in the natural might seem big, but I want to say to you spiritually, it's far greater. It's far greater. I want to tell you, New Day, that the footprint that you have in the spiritual realms is a footprint that brings intimidation and fear in the camp of the enemy. Thank you for the five of you. Let me say that again. The footprint, no, wait. The footprint that you guys have in the spiritual realms or on a spiritual plane is a footprint that brings fear in the camp of the enemy. Now you can say it. Amen? And uh, if you are here this evening and you're saying, sure, that sounds wonderful, um, that's obviously for the church um, on a whole. I want to say to you, don't underestimate the power of the testimony that you have in your individual capacity because of your position in Christ Jesus. Amen? You are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And I love saying that. That means that you have a higher vantage point than your enemy. And if you know anything about warfare, you'll know that if you have a higher vantage uh, uh, point, you actually have a, a, a better, what, do you, what can I say? You've got, you've got a better vantage over your enemy because you can see them. You can see what they're doing. And you can be one step, two step, ten steps ahead of them and to, to, to bring kingdom exploits wherever God has placed you. Amen? So what's the message this evening? Firstly, as I was standing here in worship this evening, I was, just, I was thinking about all the, all the times that Angie and I had here at New Day. We were here for seven years, and I want to say to you, it was, it was a seven life-changing years. In January 2013, I got to a point in my, in my walk with the Lord where I was crying out to the Lord. I said, Lord, there must be more than this. There must be more than this. And it wasn't just a night polite little Lord, there must be more than this, and then I fell asleep. No, there was something in my heart that cried out to the Lord. And I wrote it in my journal, and as I was, as I was writing it in my journal, I was crying, and the tears wet my journal as I was writing that sentence. Lord, there must be more than than this. And I want to say to you, God heard my prayer. That was in the January, that was in January 2013. It was like God heard my prayer. He did hear my prayer. And he took me into a year long uh, encounter with him where whether I was awake or asleep, I was physically aware of the presence of the Lord. Just walking with him, aware of his presence. And I want to say to you, it, it changed my life forever. And I want to say to you this evening that I believe that there are many people here tonight that is crying that same cry. Lord, there must be more than this. Amen? 
Lord, there must be more than this. There must be more that you've called me to. There must be more um, for, you, for, for me to walk in. There must be more than this. And I want to say to you, when you cry that kind of cry, you paint a bullseye on your chest for the Holy Spirit to come and get you. Amen? Is there anyone like that in this place here this evening? Lord, there must be more than this. And I want to say to you some good news this evening. There is more than this. He gives His Spirit without measure. Without measure. Amen? So I've entitled my message this evening, Breaking the Rules of Religion. Anton, we're not religious. Really. Breaking the Rules of Religion. Now a little disclaimer here this evening. Two weeks ago, was it, a, was it two weeks ago? I think it was two weeks ago. We saw the coronation of the King of England. I didn't watch it, I just saw it. Ange watched all of it. <laughs> but just a little disclaimer, I, was, I, I walked past our TV set, it was on, and I watched this coronation, and there was Charles sitting on his throne, and below his throne was a yellow oak, a, a, a ochre yellow carpet. And I looked at all of this, and they began to sing a song. And I don't know the exact words to the song that they sang, but there was this one phrase that just struck my heart. It was this one phrase, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. If you could hear what they were singing, because it was very traditional. But they sang, Holy Spirit, come. And I heard those words, and all of a sudden I looked at the screen, and I saw the, the sophistication and the, the, you know, the tradition and the, all the rituals and all the things that have been passed down from one generation to the next. And all of a sudden I could see this, but I had this vision of all these people singing this song, Holy Spirit, come, and this yellow ochre carpet being ripped out underneath them and the Spirit of God falling and the Spirit of God filling people. And I believe that the Lord is calling His people to come into a place where He's going to rip the carpet of religiosity out under us. And He's going to do what He wants to do. Why? Because God has not called us to religion. God has called us to relationship with Him. He's called us to walk with Him. He's called us to know His presence intimately. And so in 2013, we lived in Emerald Estate in Greenstone, and for those who live there, you'll know that at the one side of Emerald Estate, there's this little pathway. It's a pathway that's almost exactly 800 meters long. How do I know it? Because I walked it thousands of times. Every single, every single day I walked this path. In the evening, I would go and walk. In the morning, I'd go and walk. Why? Not because I wanted to escape happy hour with the kids. No, I wanted to spend time hosting the presence of Jesus. And I want to say to you, New Day, the Lord has called this house to be a people that host His presence. A people that walk with Jesus. I remember many, many times walking, sometimes 9, 10 o'clock at night, just on this, on this pathway. And being so mindful of the presence of Jesus, that I would be too scared to look behind me because I knew that He was with me. And I want to say to you, Jesus is calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling individuals to, to walk in step with Him. He's calling individuals to become mindful of His footsteps with you. He is the great Paracletos, the Holy Spirit, the one that draws alongside you. And as you walk with Him, you don't walk in religion, you walk in relationship with Him. Amen? So breaking the rules of religion. That's on this house. Amen? Jesus has called this house to break the rules of religion, and to see a generation of, of people walking in true relationship with His Son. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Praise, praise the Lord that we are not here because of religion. We are here because of relationship. If we were here because of religion, it would just be so dead. No, we're here because of relationship. And so tonight, I just want to unpack that a little bit because I feel the Lord's called this house to break the rules of religion. So the first thing that I want to say is please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 5. That will be amazing. And then the first, the second thing that I want to say, just as I launch into this word that I, that I feel the body needs to hear 
today is that breaking the rules of what religion tells us to do or what religion tells you to be is often the very first step to walking in kingdom freedom. I want to tell you, religion will tell you, you need to look a certain way, you need to speak a certain way, you need to smell a certain way, you need to behave a certain way, and before you know it, you have a packaged version of Christianity. That's religion. Amen? And when you come to a place where you can break free of what religion tells you to be or what religion tells you to do, you begin to walk in step with the Spirit of God. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Not caught up in religion. That's number one. Number two, breaking the rules of religion is not a once-off event. What do you mean by that, Anton? Breaking the rules of religion is not a once-off event. No, if you and I as believers do not guard the deposit of the Holy Spirit, keeping us free, if we don't guard that deposit of our relationship with the Holy Spirit, guess what will happen? Religion will be at your door knocking to come in. It is truth that will set you free, but it's walking with truth that will keep you free. We need to be a people that walk in truth and with truth. He is the spirit of truth. Amen? Otherwise, we become religious. So let's, let's read together from Luke chapter 5. Are you there? Are you there and here? Are you there? It says in chapter 5, verse 27, after this, after what? After Jesus heals the paralyzed man. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. It's amazing, just note who Jesus chooses. He chooses a tax collector. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of law who belonged to the sect complained to his disciples like they always do. It's amazing how religious people will always complain. They'll always criticize. They'll always have something negative to say, even in the midst of a great move of the Holy Spirit. Always. They complained. They complained. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to the sect complained to his disciples, why do you... Eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners. Why? Because it was strange to them. Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but call sinners to repentance. And then Jesus goes into two micro parables. Listen to this. Then Jesus said to him, John's, sorry, sorry, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do yours. Yeah, so do ours, said the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of, an, out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise... They will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, new, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. Listen to this. For they say the old is better. Jesus is the most non-religious person you'll ever meet. And I want to tell you the church often has a problem with that. Just watch who Jesus called. Jesus calls Levi a tax collector. And I want to just unpack this a little bit. Just look at how Jesus breaks the rules of religion. Number one, Levi was a tax collector. You know, often we read scriptures and 
we, we, we read scriptures to get to the end of the chapter. We read scriptures just to get through our Bible reading plan and we often skim over certain phrases and certain words that actually have an incredible uh, weight behind them, have context behind them. And that is the same here with Levi. It says that Levi was a tax collector. Anton, why is that important? Because tax collectors were the scum of the earth. The scum of the earth. If you can think of the scum of the earth to, in today's uh, society, who would the scum of the earth be? I'm not going to get into trouble. You can think about that. <laughs> scum of the earth. There's no scumminess in this room right now. I said this the other day at New Day, and uh, you all know Wayne Schofield. Another guy said, there's only one guy. It's Wayne. He's the scum. <laughs> but there's no scum of the earth here. But here's the thing. Tax collectors and sinners were, were, were the most hated people in society. They were the scum of the earth. Why? Because they worked with the Romans. And so what would happen was, is that the Roman colonial government, the, the, the colonial government of Rome would infiltrate an area. They will take a, a rough census of the amount of people that would be in that region. And then they would calculate the amount of tax that needs to come in per uh, region. Then they would sell the rights of collecting the tax to the highest bidder or the highest backhand. So if you think corruption is bad today, back then it was far worse. Far, far worse. And so often they would, they would bribe the Roman government, they would bribe the government officials, and then they would, they would get the, the rights to, to go and collect the tax for that region. And then what they would do is, is that everything that they brought in, over and above that which the Roman government told them to get in, they would pocket and so viciousness, cheating, and fear, and intimidation was the tools of the trade. If you saw a tax collector, you give him what he wants and you get out of there. If you saw a tax collector and he hasn't made eye contact with you, you better just move on. It's like that friend that you try and avoid. There he is, in the shops. I don't do that. Ange does it. They were the scum of the earth. And Jesus walks with his disciples and he sees this man sitting at, his tax, at the tax collecting booth. Levi wasn't at synagogue. He wasn't up in a tree like Zacchaeus trying to see what Jesus was doing. No, it says that Levi was sitting at his tax collecting booth. He was sitting in his wickedness. He was sitting in his corruption. He was sitting in his sin, in his viciousness, in, his, in the tools of the trade. And Jesus looks at him and he says, hey, Levi, come follow me. Jesus breaks every religious rule that is in the book, the book of religious laws and regulations. He breaks that rule. He says, Levi, come and follow me. And Levi responds to Jesus. Just, just imagine this. The scum of the earth, whoever that is in your mind right now, Jesus looks at them. I'm not pointing at anyone. Jesus looks at him or them, and Jesus said to me, says, says to me, no, says to them, come follow me. Come follow me. Levi goes from wickedness to full time ministry in one step. Just just process that. He goes from being a tax collector to being one of Jesus' disciples in one step. Jesus didn't look at Levi and say to him, Hey, Levi, come follow me. But before you come follow me, maybe just go to the school of supernatural ministry. Maybe go to Bible school. Maybe go and spend some time repenting, uh, you know, being restored, getting this church vibe. And then come follow me. Jesus says to him, come follow me. And in an instant, he enters full-time ministry with Jesus. In an instant. And you can just imagine the religious. You can just imagine perhaps even some of the other disciples that walked with Jesus. They looked at Jesus and they must have gone, Yo, Jesus, we noticed that this morning while it was still dark, you woke up and you left. Did you sleep all right? Is everything okay, Jesus? 
Jesus, do you even know who this man is? He's a tax collector, Jesus. And then to be very, very religious, there may have been those who would have gone, Jesus, we absolutely, how, we, we just love how prophetic you are. To look past this man's wickedness and to see him walk as a disciple one day. Jesus, should we put him on our 10-year plan of repentance, restoration, and, you know, paying all the money back. And 10 years from now, Jesus, I reckon you'll probably be a good Christian. No, no, no. Jesus says, come follow me. Jesus says, come follow me and have on the job training with me. Jesus broke the rules of religious, religion. He broke the rules of religion. You can imagine the Pharisees, you can imagine even some of Jesus' disciples thinking, Jesus, you're going against every, every, everything, every religion, every tradition of Israel right now. Jesus says, come follow me. You know, I want to just say something here this evening that, that probably will offend some people. But I know you're used to it because Greg does it every Sunday. <laughs> Jesus invites Levi to full-time ministry straight away. Straight away. Jesus invites Levi to come and do on-the-job training with him straight away. Perhaps, just perhaps, perhaps, Perhaps the church today or believers today feel we need special training to be effective because we are not on the job with Jesus. Just perhaps. Perhaps. Perhaps we are so consumed with our agendas. Perhaps we are so consumed with our training programs and everything that we need to do, our building projects, that we are not on the job anymore. We are hiding behind training programs and church buildings and we're actually just ineffective. Jesus breaks the rules. He, he breaks the mindset of the religious. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not against training. And Jesus is not against training. Jesus is not against discipleship. As a matter of fact, he said, go therefore and do what? Make disciples. But what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus. What, is, what does a follower of Jesus do? He or, or she, they get on-the-job training for effective ministry. So I'm not against training, and I know that this house is a house that equips, that trains. You've got training centers. But I want to say to us, as believers, if we are hiding behind our training and never become effective ministers out there, we're missing the point. Because we can become religious even about training. We can become religious even about Bible school. We can become religious around worship. Is worship just another genre? No, it's worship. It's about the heart. It's about meeting with God in, my, in this attitude of worship, relationship with Him. Relationship with God is the ultimate expression of what worship is. Amen. Did you hear that? It's not the lights. It's not the cameras. There he is. It's not how loud we sing. No, it is how we are connected to him. Connected to him. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said this. He said that there's a direct correlation between the believer's spiritual life or health and his love for God. Just process that. Why do we sing? Why do we worship? Why do we shout? Why do we dance? Because we love Him. Because we worship Him. And I believe the church needs to come back to this one thing, that it's about relationship with Him. It's not about anything else. Do you know that we can worship, even if we're quiet? Why? Because God is looking for a heart of worship. We worship in spirit and in truth. Amen? Levi had no training. He simply responded to Jesus. How did Levi respond to Jesus? This is amazing. Are you ready for it? G Levi held a banquet. That's how he responded to Jesus. It says he left everything and straight away he organized the biggest party. 
and he invited all his other scummy friends. He invited all the, the scum of the earth. He invited tax collectors and sinners and he held a massive party at his house. How did he respond? Well, he had a house. He had great wealth. The source of the wealth. Well, but guess what? Something of Levi's heart was changed. And you can just imagine at this party, people coming, hey Levi, how many people did you rip off today? How many people did you threaten today? You must understand the tax collectors of the day, some of them had their own private security. They were so hated by society that they had to have bodyguards to look after them. And so they were feared. They had bodyguards around them. They used intimidation and fear to get people poor, <laughs> to rip them off. And you can just imagine at this banquet, people coming to Levi. Levi, what on earth are you doing? Do you know who you've invited to your house? And Levi's response, something like this. Do you know what? I don't know what I'm doing, but something in here has changed. Something in here has changed. I can't give you any answers. This man said to me, I must come follow him. I must become a disciple of him. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what tomorrow holds for me. But let me tell you what. Something has changed in here. I can't answer the questions that you're asking me right now. But come with me. Let me introduce you to the man that changed something inside of me here. That is how simple it is. And I want to say to you, you all have homes. You all have an ability to invite people to your home and to invite people to this house and to say, come and meet the man named Jesus that changed everything within me over here. Come and meet him. Let me ask you this question. How much ministry experience did Levi have? How much? Nothing. How much knowledge of ministry did Levi have? Nada. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. Jesus says, come follow me. Talk about kingdom influence. I want to tell you, when Jesus has your heart, kingdom influence will spill out of you. When Jesus has your attention, when, when Jesus has your devotion, you don't have to minister. You know those old cars that you used to wind up like this? To start, not that I've ever done it but I've seen it in the movies. You don't have to try and wind up this thing called ministry. I've got to wind this thing up. No, no, no. When I walk with Him, I minister effortlessly. When I know Him, I minister effortlessly. And there's many people, even in this room tonight, that, that you've disqualified yourself, not because people have disqualified you, no, but because you think that God can't use you. Just respond to him tonight. Just respond to him tonight. Here's the incredible thing that we learn from Levi is that the grace of God, listen carefully, the grace of God needs no preparation. There's one or two that agrees with that. The grace of God needs no preparation. The grace of God coming upon someone's life can produce results instantly. I've seen it in my own life. The grace of God coming into someone's life, coming upon someone's life, can produce the results that no amount of training can fulfill. The grace of God. And it's right here, right here with this very statement right now <laughs> that offends the religious mind. And you can just imagine the Pharisees looking at Jesus and as he called Levi to himself, how can this man all of a sudden become one of Jesus' disciples? How? Jesus breaks the rules of religion. Why? Because of his grace. Because of his grace. Why? Why were they so upset with Jesus? Were they so upset with Jesus because Jesus was so aggressive towards sinners and tax collectors? Where, was that the reason? Were they so upset with Jesus because he was fasting? No. The reason they were so upset with Jesus is because he broke every religious rule. 
The reason they were so upset with Jesus is because of how gracious Jesus was towards men like Levi and many, many others. Amen? He broke the religious rules. And we need to understand something with Jesus' interaction with Levi, with Jesus' interaction, especially with the Pharisees, that the Pharisees come to Jesus and they look at Jesus at, at Levi's house, house and what do they do they rebuke jesus they rebuke jesus how do they rebuke jesus well they use the issue of fasting they say to jesus jesus we've watched you john's disciples fast and pray our disciples fast and pray what are they saying jesus our disciples John's disciples, they doing everything according to the, to the customs and the traditions of Israel. Why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus had, a, had an answer to their question. Actually, he had two answers to, to Jesus' question. Number one, Jesus says to them, guys, your timing is completely off. Your timing is completely off. How can you fast when the bridegroom is with you? And secondly, Jesus says to them, how can you sew a new, a new piece of cloth onto an old garment? Or, why, or how can you pour new wine into an old wineskin? Firstly, this first answer, your timing is off. Your timing is off. Why is their timing off? Because they've become religious. And how often does the church fall into religion and their timing is off? And it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. They come to Jesus and they, Jesus and they, Jesus and they, say, and they say to him, Jesus, John's disciples fast and our disciples fast. The disciples of the Pharisees were disciples that followed everything by the law. John's disciples broke away from a religious structure and they entered a, a, a lifestyle of prayer and fast, fasting as John did. So when, so when people looked at John's disciples, they looked at John's disciples and they, in a sense, looked at a people that broke away from tradition. We, this radical man named John, this radical man, this man that preaches uh, in the wilderness, that eats uh, wild honey, he broke all the rules of religion. And they say to him, they say to Jesus, Jesus, John's disciples, this man that is so radical, they, his disciples pray and fast. Our disciples pray and fast. Why don't you pray and fast? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we do not keep in step with the Spirit of God, even what may seem radical today can still become religious. Can still become religious. Amen? What is Jesus saying? Talking about the wine and the wineskin. Jesus is saying, he's saying, new wine new, needs new wineskins. I'm, I'm not a wine expert, but apparently they say that wine goes through a fermentation process. And at a certain point in this fermentation process, the alcohol level in the wine becomes stable. It cannot change. It's, it just stays the same. But when it goes through this fermentation process, what happened back in the day, they didn't store wines in vats. They stored wine in wineskins. The wine undergoing this fermentation process would stretch the wineskin, and the wineskin would grow with the wine. And when you took an old wineskin and you poured new wine into an old wineskin, what would happen? the new wine would expand to such a place that the wineskin would be broken. What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying? The new wine of what I'm wanting to do cannot be placed in an old wineskin. The new wine of the Holy Spirit cannot be placed. The work that you see took place in Levi's life cannot be contained in an old wineskin, in your traditions, in your, you know, uh, what do you call it? Traditions, uh, habits, cultures. No, 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 no. We've got to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. I've told this story many, many times. 
but I want to just tell it again. I don't think I've told it yet. There was me, quite a number of years ago, I was at a, I was at a conference in, in America. And uh, at this conference, I was so aware of the presence of God just throughout the whole conference. And I stayed about six kilometers from this venue where the, where the conference took place. And I didn't have uh, transport. I just walked to the conference and then walked home every evening. And that evening, after experiencing the presence of the Lord, just in a tangible, tangible way, I put in my earphones and I started walking back. And I was walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Not for any reason other than just to spend time with the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that when you walk in step with the Holy Spirit, you cannot remain the same? The Holy Spirit does things inside of you that goes beyond your own understanding. And so I was walking with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, turn off your worship music. That's what he said to me. Turn off your worship music. I turned off my worship music. I can't remember exactly what I was listening to. Turned off my worship music, and uh, he said to me, Anton, put on any secular music that is on your phone. And I think I had like four or five, because I was so religious. And... <laughs> It wasn't Celine Dion, Brett. <laughs> That's what you listen to. I've been in your car. And he said to me, put on any secular music. I want to meet with you. And you know what happened with me? A religious spirit rose up within me. And I started arguing with the presence of the Holy Spirit. I started arguing. And in a moment like this, the presence of God lifted off me. And I broke. I broke. I realized how religious I had become. I want to say to you that the footprint, the footprint that God has called this church to be will go beyond any religious mindset, beyond any religious, you know, limitation. But it starts here, realizing, seeing areas in our lives where we've become religious. And so I was having this, this argument with the Holy Spirit as I was walking. I was saying, Holy Spirit, I can't. I can't. I need worship music. I need to wait on you. I need to know your presence in worship. And I didn't feel his presence. And I broke. I started crying. And then after some time, I, I took my phone out. And I put on Mumford and Sons. And as I played, that, as that guitar went, that first strum of the guitar, the presence of the Lord came upon me. And I had about another five kilometers home. I struggled to walk home that evening. I walked as a drunk man under the presence of the Lord. And I realized how religious I had become. How religious I had become. I've been walking with, with God for many, many years. As a, young, as a young child, being in meetings like this, under the presence of the Lord, seeing people healed, saved, delivered, going to life group meetings and falling asleep under the coffee table while my parents prayed for people and people getting touched by God. I grew up in church, but I realized how religious I had become. How religious I had become. You know, the, the religious spirit will always be in opposition to the grace of God. Always. Always. Why? Because with religion, you can control people. With religion, you can manipulate people. With religion... You can have safe church. You can have predictable church. And New Day, I want to say this to you tonight. God has not called this house to be a safe church. A safe house. No, 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 no. God has called this people, these you as, as a people, to have a big footprint in the realm of the Spirit where you walk in step with Him, not because you are religious, but because you are a people about relationship. Amen. A people about relationship. Religion will always be in opposition to the newness, the new wine of the Holy Spirit, the new wine of the gospel, the gospel that impacted men and women like Levi. I just love the Word of God in how the Word of God prepares us for what comes next. Jesus has this interaction with Levi 
And straight away, Jesus begins to talk to them about the new wine. The new wine. Why? It's because Jesus is wanting our hearts to be prepared. If a man like, like Levi can come into the kingdom, if a man like Levi can become a disciple of Jesus, then anyone can. Please hear that. Please hear that. But the religious will always be in, in opposition to the grace of God. God operates through grace. He does not work. He does not operate through legalism. Please hear me. It's not through legalism. It's through grace. Amen? The grace of God. You know, there's that famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I'm not going to try and sing it. You know, when that song was, was written by Isaac Watts many, many years ago, that song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, was rejected in church circles because it wasn't singing scripture directly. Why? The new wine. The new wine of the Holy Spirit cannot be contained in old wineskins. What is it that the Holy Spirit is doing in this room right now? What is, it, what is it that the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart right now? Where have you become religious? Because it's that area in your life that will limit the new wine of the Holy Spirit. What is it? What is it? We're driving in our cars in the morning and we've got the worship going. We're in our little safe bubble. And the moment we get into our work sphere or our work environment, all of a sudden, everything that we experienced in our little Christian bubble on our way to church just goes out the window. You see, Jesus, Jesus breaks the rules of religion and he calls Levi's to have banquets at his house and to have kingdom influence where he's got influence. Where is it that God's called this house to have kingdom influence? Nuda, let me ask you this question. What would it look like for New Day, every single one of you, to break the rules of religion on Monday morning? What would it look like? What would it look like to give Jesus what you have? And to say, Jesus, I'm done with religion. I'm wanting to be more about relationship with you and with one another, with the people that come across my path. What would it look like? I was praying the other day and I said, Lord, what is it that you wanting new, what is it that you want upper room to hear this Sunday? And I felt the Lord speak so clearly to me. He said to me, Anton, it's not enough to pray for revival. It's not enough. We have to become revival wherever we go. We have to be revival wherever we go. If we are only praying for revival and we do not use what God has given, what God has placed within us, we're missing the point. We're missing the the point. Yeah, but Anton, I'm not qualified. Yeah, but Anton, I'm still sitting behind my little tax collecting booth. Jesus says, come follow me. Come follow me. How much of the church is hiding behind a version of Christianity that we have created and it lacks the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? How much? Jesus says, let that go. Let that go. Amen. And just giving me the eyes. I just want to address that, that point Anton made about people in the room disqualifying themselves. I think a lot of us really feel that we need to die in installments. When Jesus paid the full price, the full price. And if you think you had anything to do with that, that would make you the Savior. He took on the whole price so that you could live in union with Him. And Anton said right at the beginning, God, your union with Him. This world will throw a lot at you, but if you guard your union with Him, 
Friends, religion will say qualify for that union where grace will say, come just as you are. And there are people who need to hear, just as you sit here now with the stuff clinging to you, come just as you are. And when the enemy wants to keep you in the bondage of sin, praise Jesus because he came for the sinner. I'm so aware of the fact that we give him our hearts and then he calls us holy and then he calls us flawless. And then he says, we are without blemish. When last did you acknowledge yourself as holy in his sight? Oh no, that's thinking too much of myself. You are holy in his sight. You are flawless in his sight. Religion is against everything that Jesus came to break. Jesus only preached good news. I don't know why anyone preaches anything else but good news. If Jesus preached good news, friends, I want to remind you that you are, are in Him and Jesus in you. Not because it was first your desire, but because He desired you. It says in Psalm 18, He rescued you because He delights in you. And some of us have this habit of dirtying our hands. We want to up earth the old self, leave the old self, come into full union with Jesus. And it's in that place that I can be an effective witness for His name's glory. And then here's the other thing. Jesus May your glory fall. Where? In and through you, friends. In and through you, His glory, the hope. I I just feel like we need to let this revelation land. Anton is saying, strip off. Anton's not saying be rebellious, never listen to worship again. No, strip off the stuff that clings you, keeps you bonded to the old self. That thing is dead and buried. That thing is dead and buried. You are one in Jesus. And then you know what Jesus says? Jesus prays and He says, Father, just as you and I are one, make them one in us. And the Father says, granted. We actually undermine what Jesus did on the cross when we don't walk in the full confidence of who we are in Jesus. So I'm telling you, friends, some of us need to repent. Jesus, I'm so sorry that I have clung to the old self when it's so good to be in union with you. And others need to say, I repent for disqualifying myself. I'm not called or I'm not as called. This month I hope to stop this sin and maybe by next month I'll be able to come out of that sin. When you are caught up in in union with Him, friends. I love the scripture. It's it's the theme of my life. Well, He gave it to me at the beginning of this year and I never want to lose it. It's that scripture in John. It says, He must become greater. I must become less. Can we just allow the Holy Spirit to blow off some stuff so that He can be made great in and through my life? I don't know how you want to respond. Jesus said this, new wine, let's just close our eyes, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new. Why? For they say the old is better. What is Jesus saying? More than what Jesus is saying is is what Jesus is showing us. He's showing us that people do not like change. We like things the way that they have been. We like things that we know. We like things that we're familiar with. And I've just got this strong sense that even here this evening, that Jesus is wanting to break off people old mindsets old ways you see that oldness that old wineskin has to go to make room for the new wine of the Holy Spirit has to has to Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting 
uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you. Maybe a, a thumbs up. Maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is he's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is the Lord and if you confess him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. Uh, if you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.